You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is our pastor and preacher, Eric Clerk. Well, good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. We're in the wonderful book of Revelation. Last week we talked about him being on the Isle of Patmos. That was verse 9. Today we're going to do verse 10. Okay, read for me. Revelation chapter 1. Let's pick up, let, let's start just in verse 10. Read for me 10 and 11. Okay, thank you. Look at that verse 10. He says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. We're going to look at point number one. We're just going to look a little bit at that in the Spirit part. And then on the Lord's Day, we'll look at the Lord's Day as our second point. And then he heard behind him a voice, and it was as of a trumpet, right? We're going to look at that too. That's going to be our third point. Next week, we'll, we'll pick up and we'll look more at the seven churches specifically. But something I want you to see as we look at, and we're going to, and I'm just saying, giving you the outlay of the points, so because we're going to keep moving, and I want, we, we may not come back to this chapter. And so I just want you to see that. So the first thing I want to talk about is what he says there is in the spirit on the Lord day. Focus on the, in the spirit. And I want you to see something. Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 and, and just turn there. While you turn there, I just want to tell you something. When, when John says he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, what he's not saying, what he's not saying is that he went to some charismatic church and he's, you know, <coughs> flopping around on the ground like a fish out of water or, you know, hopping up and down screaming and shouting and he's slain in the spirit, what they call it, okay? That's not what he's saying, okay? He's also not saying that he went to a church by the Seventh-day Adventists on the Sabbath day, okay? Well, I'll, I'll show you just now what the term, the phrase, Lord's Day, mean. It, it doesn't mean what most people try and make it sound as to what it means. But first I want to look at, at his in the spirit. In, in Matthew chapter 16, I want you to read something real interesting. We want to look at verse 28, but pick up for me in verse 27. Start reading in 27. Let me ask you a question. Number verse 27, that's a second Advent reference. That is as clear as daylight. Verse 28, he says that there are some standing there. He's not going to stay deaf until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, who was he talking to at that point? He was talking to his disciples, right? Okay, so 12 men standing in front of him. How many of them saw him coming in his kingdom? Has that already happened? That's still in the future, right? right. Um, how many of them have died? All of them. Okay. Did the Lord lie? No. No. Okay, so how, how did this happen? Okay, so let me explain this to you. There were some standing there. Why did he not say there's one of you standing here? He didn't say that. He said some, right? Some can be one. It could be many. Okay, why, why did God choose to say some? The reason is, and I'm going to be very simple... It's, it's, it's very simply this. The, the Jews had rejected God the Father back in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when they asked for a king. Then they rejected God the Son in Matthew chapter 27 when they nailed him to a cross and they crucified him. Then they rejected God the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7. After they rejected God the Holy Ghost, the gospel went out to the Gentiles and it started the 2000 year of the church age. Now, so what, what would have happened... If, if the Jews had accepted the testimony of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and they had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ 
as the Messiah. What would have happened was the tribulation would have started right at that point. And all of them, except Judas, would have seen the, and perhaps maybe also except James, because he was beheaded in, 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 in Acts chapter 12. So at least 10 of them could have perhaps have made it through the tribulation and seen the Son of Man coming. Okay, that could have happened. But that didn't happen. Why? Because the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. God, God gave them the option, and it was God's plan A for them to accept him as their Messiah, but they rejected him. So what happened is he took down, he took his seat at the end of Acts chapter 7, and he, he raised up Saul, who became Paul, and he became the minister to the Gentiles, and we have the church age, and that's how you and I get in. Okay, the, Romans chapter 11. Now, how did God leave the door open for somebody to still see him coming in his kingdom? Easily. He, he takes John, the apostle John, in AD, down about AD 94 to 96, down about, takes him in the spirit, takes him up into heaven. And guess what happens once you get in heaven? You see things from, from outside of time. When you're outside of time, you can see things. You can see before you were even born. You can see until after you, you, you know, things that's going to happen in eternity. And that's what we see happening in this verse, is God takes John up in the spirit and he sees things. So did John see the second advent? Did he see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? He did. He did before he tasted death. He was on the Isle of Patmos. God took him up into eternity, into, sorry, in, into the future. And he looked back and he saw the second advent. So the words of Jesus Christ right there came to be true. And so that's, that's the explanation for that. And that's what we are looking at in the spirit. How did God take him up? Did he take him up in his body? No, he took him up in his spirit. We see other prophets in the Bible. We saw the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 40. He gets taken up and he goes up there and he, he goes into the future and he measures. He actually goes into the temple that is not even built today. It's the temple that's going to get built in the millennial kingdom. And Ezekiel then he went up there, and he's out there measuring this thing. You want to see it? Go read Ezekiel 40, uh, to 40 verses, um, chapter 40, to about 42, and you'll see him. It measures every single room, how, how much it is. And you know what? We, we watch movies like Back to the Future and things like that from Hollywood, and you wonder, how do they come up with these ideas? They got it from the Bible. okay? Because one, once we go deeper into the book of Revelation, you're going to see that while John is up there, and now remember, John lived in the first century. While he's up there, so if the um, yeah he lived in the first century, and while he's up there, he's going to see, he's going to describe to us the temple. And guess what he sees when he's looking at the temple? He sees a man measuring the temple. So he's he's out there in the future looking back, and he sees a guy measuring the temple, and that's the guy Ezekiel back in Ezekiel 40, who lived like something like seven or eight centuries before John. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> it's just amazing. We're going to get to that. It's absolutely fascinating. Another guy went up into heaven in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, was Paul, the apostle Paul. He went up also. And so what I want you to see is that God is able to take somebody, and when he takes them up into heaven, you are outside of time. And you can see things from a completely different perspective. This is really neat stuff. Okay? Now, I want to, want to share something with you. In, in, in John chapter 5, we, le- we learn that, and while I'm talking, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Okay, you don't have to go to John 5, but in John 5, the Lord was talking, and he talked about two specific resurrections in verse 28. He talked about the resurrection, and 29, he talks about the resurrection of the life and the resurrection of damnation. And, and that is, those two resurrections, by the way, are separated by about a thousand years. The resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. In the Bible, there's actually seven different resurrections, and we're not going to study them today, but I just want you to know that. What I do want to tell you about, because it helps us understand a lot of things that we'll be looking at, and remember, as we're going through the first chapter, we are laying a lot of foundation here. The, the, the resurrection of life is subdivided into three different parts. You can call those catching ups, you can call them raptures, catching aways, but the resurrection of life is broken into three different parts and they match the three pilgrims festivals in the Bible. I'm going to show you something. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, let's look at the three festivals. These are the three times a year that a Jewish man 
an, a, a Jew had to go up to the temple to make his sacrifices. Okay, the, this is in the law of Moses. Read for me Deuteronomy 16. Read for me verse 16, please. They shall not appear before the Lord empty. Read verse 17. Every man shall give as he is equal, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given you. So you don't show up to these feasts empty handed. You see that? And what are the three feasts? It's Passover, and it's Passover, the unleavened bread. The feast of unleavened bread is after the Passover. And then 50 days later, you have the feast of weeks. Seven times seven is 49, and the day after that was Pentecost. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles that we've talked about last week, right? That was the third time. And so these three feasts coincided with when, 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 when the fruit was coming in. It also coincides when, when little lambs are born, and when the barley harvest comes in, and when the wheat harvest comes in. And, and you guys who do gardening, you'll know that, for example, our blueberry garden... We'll get some blueberries that will come in early, early varieties. They'll, they'll turn blue long before the others. The others are still green and still small, and you have some that are already blue. That is called your first fruits. So when they came to the Lord during the festival of unleavened bread, they brought to the Lord their first fruits. Then, 50 days later, that's when the major crops comes in. That's the main harvest. And then several weeks after that, you have the Feast of Tabernacles, and that was when the gleanings, or the gleanings came in. Some people pronounce it differently, but it's gleanings. Gleanings is just you go in, and you get the fruit that still remains. When we, we, when we go in during the main harvest, and we pluck our blueberries, you know, one of the things that you'll see is that they still sound a little green. And you don't want to pluck those, because they, they're just not going to ripen right. So you leave them on the vine, and then you come back, about a month later, then some of them are still green, and you wait a little bit, and then you go back and you harvest them. Sometimes, as late as early October, we'll go and harvest some of those. And when the main harvest was really back in July, you see what I'm saying? So those are the gleanings that comes afterwards. Now, what God does, and you can see God the Father, He's associated with the Passover, okay? Because that's when the angel of the Lord went through and killed every house that didn't have the blood on the, the door. Remember that? Back in Egypt. And then you have God, the Holy Ghost, associated with Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And then God the Son is associated with the Feast of Tabernacles because He was born during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles and He came to tabernacle with us, God in the flesh. So each one of the Godhead is associated with the Feast, but one more specific with each one of these feasts, God the Father with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God the Holy Ghost associated with the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, and God the Son who is associated with Tabernacles. Absolutely amazing. God uses those same principles when He, in the first resurrection, when He, the resurrection of life. Okay, I want you to see something here. Turn your Bibles, let's look at the, the first fruits, okay? Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. I want to look at a passage there. I want to show you the first fruits as they were, the first catching away that occurred. And we find that in Matthew chapter 27. Now what happens in Matthew 27? It is the crucifixion of our Lord, right? Go to Matthew chapter 27. Read for me verse 50. That's where we see that the Lord dies in verse 50. So he dies in, in verse 50. Now read for me verse 51 through 53, please. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept rose. And, and they the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. 
Now, this is something interesting that Matthew puts in here for us. Because in the very next verse, you see the Roman soldiers go down a little bit. You see Joseph of Arimathea taking his body down. But and then in Matthew chapter 28, we are going to see the actual resurrection. You know, when they, the woman comes and the stone is rolled away in that empty tomb. We see that in Matthew 28. But right here in Matthew 27, he puts something in there. Look at what he says there in verse 53. He says that many of the saints rose, what is it, after his resurrection. After his resurrection. The Lord didn't resurrect until three days later. These saints rose after the Lord's resurrection. You see, the first resurrection is the resurrection of our Lord. But then we saw the first fruits. What was the first fruit? It was these Jewish saints who resurrected right here. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Now, let me show you something. Every time the Lord gives us something in the Bible, He'll typically will, he'll give us a cross-reference, okay? And go to Proverbs chapter 25. Let me show you a cross-reference to this passage. It's absolutely fascinating. Proverbs chapter 25. Just amazing how God puts it in His Word. First people who came up with these saints. He say, who are these saints? I don't know. These are Old Testament saints. That's all I know. I know there are some saints from the Old Testament. First fruit. Now, when you, when you go out to the blueberry garden or your tomato garden or whatever and you get your first fruit, is the first fruit the most? No, it's normally just a few, right? And then your harvest is when you get the most and then your gleanings typically afterwards is just a little bit, it's, it's not as much as the harvest. Sometimes the gleanings can be more than the first fruits, but sometimes the first fruits can be more than the, the gleanings. It just all depends on the season. However, what we see here is many of the saints those and they went into the city and it happened after his resurrection now you're in proverbs chapter 25 just for reference read verse 2 just want to show you something here it is the glory of god to conceal the thing but the honor of kings is to search out the heaven. yeah that goes along with 2 timothy 2 15 that we looked at in sunday school this morning to study to shoot thyself a blue right and nightly dividing that's it, it is it is the it's the glory of god to conceal a thing he, 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 he likes to hide things in his word, but it's our job to go and search them out. And, we, and he tells us how to do that. Let me show you something here. Talking about these, these saints of those. Read for me verse 7. So, who, who saw whom thou eyes have seen? Who, who saw him? The Old Testament saints that were alive during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Many of them saw him. And what does God say up to him? It's better for them to be said, told, come up here. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Well, notice this word, come up here. You're only going to find it three times in your Bible. And it's going to be found with the first fruits, with the harvest, and with the gleanings. And you're going to see how the Word of God is going to show it to us. Absolutely amazing. So the first fruit was the Old Testament saints that those right after the resurrection in Matthew chapter 27. Okay? What is the next one? The next one is the harvest. The harvest is, is something that is associated with the festival of weeks. And that is the rapture of the church. Okay? I'm not going to date the, the rapture here. I'm just going to tell you that it's associated with that feast. But take your Bibles, go to Revelation chapter 4. And I want to show you something, and I'm not going to get into it too deep today, because I'm going to wait till we get to Revelation 4 to go into it even deeper. And we'll look at more after passages then, and we'll explore all those different passages in detail. I just want you to see something. Here's the rapture of the church, and, and it's right there after the church is mentioned. When is the last time that the church is mentioned in the Bible, the word church? It's in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, the church of Laodicea. That is us. After the church of Laodicea, you don't find the word church again in your Bible. What happens is that church gets taken up when? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2 is what we're going to look at. So verse 1 is when they go up. Read for me verse 1. Thank you. So the voice is as of a trumpet, right? 
And what did this voice say to him? Come up here then. And I will show you the things, right? So this is where John goes up in the Spirit in verse chapter 1, verse 10. This is where he goes up in the Spirit, but it is at the same time that we are going up in the rapture of the church. But the difference is, is he's going up in the Spirit. When our rapture occurs, we go up in our bodies. Our vile bodies will, will, will become incorruptible. And we know that Philippians 3, 21 tells us that. And so, and, and also 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that. And we'll look more into that in more detail when we get there. But I want you to see that the main harvest is the rapture of the church. That is the second catching away. And, and the first one has already happened. The second one hasn't happened yet. Let me show you the third catching away, the gleanings, okay? The gleanings, you'll find that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And I'll show you that where you see the third catching away. This is the gleaning. This is the rapture of tribulation saints during the tribulation. That's not you and I. You and I go up at the second one at the harvest. Praise God for that. Because His Word tells us that we will not see the wrath to come. He's taking us out. Revelation chapter 11, read for me verse 12. Now, we looked at that a few weeks ago. What is God's mode of transportation? A cloud, cloud, right? Yeah. In Psalm 104, verse 3, it says He makes clouds His chariot, right? So, the the fact that you see the word cloud here, and you also see the word cloud associated with the rapture of the church, doesn't mean that the rapture of the church is the same here as the rapture of the saints during the tribulation, right? It doesn't mean it's the same thing. It would be the, the... you know, if suppose I asked the little girls in this room to, to describe to me the legs of an elephant, and I had an elephant standing here, each of them would describe the legs, but you would have to read the descriptions really carefully to determine if they are describing the front left leg, the front right leg, the back leg, left or right. You know, there's four legs on an elephant. If you read it, the descriptions, you might has come to the conclusion, if you were going to use the, the same logic that some people use in the Bible, you're going to come to the conclusion that the elephant only had one leg. Because every girl's description said, you know, it had a kneecap, it had a calf, it had some toes. You know, they're going to describe it that way. But meantime, each one is describing a different leg. So there's going to be slight differences. Just because you find similarities doesn't mean it makes it the same thing. The same is true for these different catching aways. You're going to see that there's going to be trumpets associated with them. You're going to find clouds in them, but you're going to look at the differences. And what we see here is this is the two witnesses that are in the tribulation that are taken up, and along with them are other tribulation saints going up. Let me prove it to you. Go to Matthew chapter 24. We'll see that up there. So all three of these catching aways, we see the words, come up here. Isn't that interesting? And we see trumpets associated with it. We see that there are often earthquakes. We see loud voice. It's just fascinating, okay? Go to Matthew chapter 24. Let me show you that the context is the second advent uh, and not the rapture. Read for me verse 30. Remember how this verse matched what we saw back in Revelation 1-7, right? A few weeks ago. Well, now read the next verse, verse 31. There goes your gleanings. And that matches the passage we just saw in Revelation 11-12. Okay, that's your gleanings, tribulation saints. When we get to Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14, it's going to become so clear and so evident that these groups are not the same, that the gleanings and the harvest are two different groups. And we'll get into it in far more detail. 
I just want to lay the foundation so that you can see that there are three different catching away. And what we see here when John goes up in the spirit, as we see in verse one, chapter 1 verse 10, that is matching. He's going up there and it is, is a type or he's a type of the church. He's going at, up around about the time of the rapture of the church is what he gets to partake in. But he goes way into the future because he's looking back and he sees things happening behind him. With like in the past. Absolutely fascinating. Okay. So let's go on. Point, point number two. Let's look at this Lord's Day. So he was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, the Lord's Day is a phrase that you find once in the Bible as Lord's Day. And you find it 29 times in the Bible as Day of the Lord. And just for the sake of time, turn your Bibles to the book of Joel. The book of Joel is one of the minor prophets Hosea, Joel. So after Daniel, you get Hosea, and then you get Joel. Go to Joel chapter 1 while I'm talking. Okay, so what is the day of the Lord in the Bible? When you look at the Lord's day or the day of the Lord, 29 plus 1 is 30. So 30 times we'll find this phrase in the Bible, either as the Lord's day or day of the Lord. What is it? Every single time that phrase is found, it's one of four things. It's either the rapture of the church, it's the tribulation, most of the time it's the second advent, the Lord coming back at the second time, and sometimes the day of the Lord can also refer to the millennial kingdom. It could refer to the battle of Armageddon at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. It can even refer to the great white throne or the, even the battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennial kingdom. Those two battles are separated by a thousand years. It can be any of that, or it can refer to the millennial kingdom as a whole, but it can refer to the rapture, the tribulation, the second advent, or something in the millennial kingdom. That's what it is. Remember, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So, so you just remember that. So when it's called the day of the Lord, it could be the thousand year millennial kingdom also. Four things, okay? Let me show you some of the references there of those 29. I'm just going to show you a couple. Joel chapter 1, read for me verse 15. Here's what I want you to see. This day of the Lord, when it is described, it is, it is as the second advent, it's not something that you want to be there for. Okay, you, you don't want to be there. Okay, read, read verse 15. Uh, the last were the day, where the day of the Lord is at hand, and as the instructions from the Almighty shall come. So, one of the things you can find is that this day of the Lord is always associated with destruction, with gloominess, with darkness. It is, it's, it's, it's going to be a terrible day for those people who are on this earth. That's why this day of the Lord is not the Sabbath. It's not Sunday. You know, people would want to take you there. Maybe a seven-day Adventist will take you to Revelation 1.10 and will say, He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. See, you've got to be in the church on the Lord's day. <laughs> no, it's not. Lord's Day, Day of the Lord, is never, ever in the Bible. Not out of any of those ty- times that it is found. I've had every single one of them. And not a single one did it mention the Sabbath. Okay, it's never the Sabbath. It's also never the first day of the week, which is Sunday, which is on the day that we have church. It's never that either. It is has to do with, in reference to the rapture, the tribulation, the second advent of the millennial kingdom. Go to chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. Lead for me the first three verses. Let's look at this day of the Lord. Notice how you can sometimes see trumpets in there too. Wow. Now read verse 10 and 11. Let's look at this thing. Wow, look at that. Words execute. The Lord is coming to execute judgment, right? Execute his word, right? His word is going to be judgment. 
Let's go down to Levitus verse 15. Yeah, again a trumpet. 31, lead verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into light before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Would you want to be there on a terrible day? Go to chapter 3. I tell you, the people who's going to be on this earth, it's, they, it's going to be terrible. Go to chapter 3, read for me verse 14 through 16. Take, read, read verse 14 by itself. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Read the next two verses. The sun, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord also shall roar by his eye, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Yeah, there are so many references in the Old Testament to the Second Advent. And one of the things that you'll notice is you, you hear the voice of the Lord, you hear a trumpet, you, you, you see that it's a day of darkness, it's gloominess, it's all of that. It's, it's unbelievable. So there's many, many more references. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go to all of them. But if you, if you want a list, just ask me. I'll give you a list and you can read them for yourself. It's fascinating. This, this, um, the day of the Lord is not a day that you want to be on this earth. You know that if you are saved, you're going to be coming down with him as one of his saints on that day. You're going to see it from the good side. You're going to see the fire come out of his mouth as he just burns up this whole planet. The army in front of him is just going to go. And they're all going to be burned to smithereens. A 200 million men army. The battle of Armageddon. This is going to be something that is absolutely... That's why the Bible calls it a terrible day. Isn't that something? Let's go over to the sound of the trumpet. I want to look at that because he said in Revelation 1.10, he said that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So the Lord's day here, and what he's talking about is, is the second advent. It can also refer to the rapture. But what I want you to see is he said, He heard behind him a voice as of a trumpet. Okay, and it told him to, to write these things down that he sees. You know, the Jews seek after a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, right? Sees sign. You see, a Jew is a, they want you to show them stuff. So God is showing things to John, okay? Go to Ze- Zephaniah chapter 1. So that's between Haggai and Habakkuk. So Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. One of the twelve minor prophets. What's, who's the number twelve for? The Jews. The Jews. That's right. Israel. Uh, twelve is the number of, of the Jews, of Israel. Right? There's twelve minor prophets. Who do you think those minor prophets are writing to? <laughs> to the Jews. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot in there. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Zephaniah chapter 1. Are you guys there? Okay, let's look at this thing. Oh, here's where you see the mighty man. Read for me verse 14 here. Mighty men are crying bitterly. Huh? Do you see there that it, it said the voice? Again, and uh, so what we see here is that voice. That's the Lord coming down, and it's going to be His voice. He's, he's, when, when God speaks, the best way that man can describe it is it sounds like a trumpet. That's the best way man can describe it. Read for me 15, all the way 15 through 18. That day, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Wow. 
How do you want to be on that deceiving end? No way. No way. If you're saved, you're not going to be there. If you're not saved, you're most likely going to die during the tribulation. If you make it to the tribulation, the very few that makes it through the tribulation, they're going to see this laugh of God. And they're going to be in the army of the Antichrist going up against him. And he's just going to destroy them. And even the mighty men are going to be crying. I mean, this is, this is rough stuff. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, let me show you a great picture in the Bible of the second advent. Absolutely amazing how this is. Go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. I want to show you this picture. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. So John is taken up and he's looking back. Now why is he looking back? It's because in front of him is eternity. And he's, like, he's looking back and he, he's, he's, he sees the second advent as it's already happened. And he sees everything into the millennial kingdom as it's already happened. And he's going to write it first in the book. So that's the book we're going to be studying over the next couple of weeks as we go through it. I just want you to see this. He's, why is he looking back? Because he's looking back into the past. He's taken up way yonder into eternity. Okay, Exodus chapter 19 Take a look at this. This is absolutely fascinating. This is now the chapter right before the law is given to the Jews. In chapter 20, they receive the Ten Commandments, right? So this is right before the Jews. And now I'm going to ask you this question. How much faith does it take to believe in God when you were one of these Israelites and you witnessed what we are about to see? Watch this. Read for me verse 9. Wow, they're supposed to believe him forever, right? Yeah, they, they didn't. But watch this thing. So the Lord is going to come down so that the people can hear him speaking to Moses. Isn't that something? Read for me verse 10 and verse 11. Wow, do you guys see what I'm seeing in this? This is unbelievable. Let them sanctify themselves today, that's one day, and tomorrow, that's two days, right? A day with the Lord is like a thousand years, okay? How long is the church age? Two thousand years. What do we do during the church age? People get sanctified, they get saved, right? They are sanctifying themselves. When is the Lord coming back? On the third day. Do you see that? Yeah. And notice he's going to come in the morning. You're going to see that. That's absolutely fascinating. Okay. But he's coming on the third day. And what does it say? It says that the people are, are going to see him. Okay. So not only do we already see that they're going to hear him, but they're also going to see him. How much faith does it take to believe in something that you can hear and see? <laughs> not much, huh? Okay. Read for me verse 16. Wow, isn't that something, huh? It is so loud that they are all shaken, they're trembling, isn't that? And you see the trumpet and you hear the, okay, now watch this. Read for me verse 17 through 19. Let's just go through it. Wow. And now watch this. It says there in, 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 in verse 17 that Moses took them out of the camp so that they can meet God, right? Yes. Do you see that? Yes. Meet the Lord. 
okay, at the gleanings, at the gleanings that we just saw in Revelation 11, 12, and in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, who went up? That was tribulation saints, right? right. Who went up in Revelation 11, 12 at the gleanings? It was the two witnesses, right? right? Who are the two witnesses? It's Moses and Elijah. Yep. So Moses is taking the people up to meet the Lord, to meet God. Do you see that? It's such an incredible picture. Absolutely unbelievable. If you have time later, read Hebrews chapter 12. Go down to verse 18 and eat through verse 20. We don't do it right now for the sake of time. But one of the things that you're going to find out when you read that is that the people, when they heard the voice of God speak, they became so filled with fear that they asked Moses, to go and speak to God because they couldn't hear, they didn't want to hear God anymore. They were too afraid. That is how bad it was. I mean, that is how incredible it is, okay? How much faith does it take to believe in God when you see something like that? Incredible, huh? Okay, so what we're going to pick up next week, we're going to pick up and we're going to go further. We'll look at the seven churches. But what I want you to see here, and then conclusion, and this is what I want you to take from this. So we just, just a little short little bit of teaching, okay? Take this to heart. In the past, John went up into the third heaven, and God allowed him to see things and write it down for us, for, for, for us to encourage us and also to for our edification. This letter is dealing with what's going to happen to the people during the tribulation period. You and I are not going to be there. But you know what is the great blessing for us out of that whole thing there, that I, everything that we just looked at? The blessing for us is that there is somebody who went up into heaven, and guess what is one of the things that he saw in Revelation chapter 4? He saw you and I, if you are saved, he saw you and I up there in heaven. How amazing is that? That somebody already saw us in heaven. So why should we worry about the things of today or the things of tomorrow if in just a couple of years we are going to be standing up there in heaven and we're going to see, hey, there's that guy, that's John. He's actually watching us. And we'll see him in heaven. You see what I'm saying? What a blessing is that, that I don't have to be worried about the things of this world. I don't have to worry about the war in the Ukraine and Russia and all that junk. I don't have to worry about politics. All I have to worry about is, is getting right with the Lord because I'm going to be standing before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to be up there in heaven and somebody's going to actually see me. And, and then we're going to look and we're also going to see, hey, there's Ezekiel measuring the temple. And oh, look there, there's, you know, the end of the... You're going to be see, seeing everything in time and you're going to see yourself in the millennial kingdom and then you're going to go down into the millennial kingdom. It's just, just so bizarre. But I tell you, it's so amazing. It's absolutely wonderful. Let's go to the Lord and prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we know it is true, that it reveals so much to us, Lord, that it is just a wonderful supernatural book. We praise you now, and we thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for thank listening, you for to, listening a recording to a recording from Shepherd's, from Shepherd's Grace, Grace Baptist, Baptist Church. Church. Please visit Please us visit at, at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.